Hey, what is going on everybody? Today we have lots of exciting stuff planned. I was hoping to do some kind of like a let's code, and uh, the idea that I had was <laughs> hopefully pretty interesting. Uh, now, if you are invested in cryptocurrency at all, uh, you kind of end up checking this website like 20 or 30 times a day. So I figured, is there a way that we can go to CoinMarketCap, uh, create kind of a data visualization thing where we pull from the CoinMarketCap API and then find some easy way to digest a lot of the information on here pertaining to like volume, market cap, changes in price, etc. Um, so we're going to, I think, build this out using Next.js so we can do some server-side rendering here. Uh, there's not really going to be a backend because we're pulling right from the API. So I'm looking forward to getting started. I think I'll do this in two parts. Uh, <laughs> As chances are, this will probably extend quite a while. Um, so let's get right into it. Okay, did a quick Google search for CoinMarketCap API, and uh, guess what? It looks like there is one. Uh, so we're off to a positive start. Um, now, I already made an account for this one. Uh, so if I go log in, it'll automatically log me in. But what you will likely have to do is uh, get your API key now, go through the login process. It's completely free. They set like a request limit on how often you can ping the API. Um, but it's pretty intuitive. Even if it's your first time doing this, just give them all of your account information and then you're, you're totally good to go. Okay, after you log in, you're going to get a dashboard like this. Uh, this is really where you can get your key to access the API. So if you're CoinMarketCap and you have uh, your database infrastructure, you have everything that you built out, you don't want people just pinging your API for free. Uh, so they need to have some way to track and limit the amount that you can do it. So when they give you this free account, they set you up with this API key and they track how often you can ping it. Now I'm hiding the bottom of my screen so you can't see my, my previous API keys. But if you press uh, regenerate key or you tap this to show the key, it'll give you this nice long string of letters and numbers. And that's what we're going to use to access the API. Nice. Okay, so now that we are set up with that, we are going to move on to creating our next application. This is super easy to do if you just open up your terminal or command line or whatever you happen to be using. Uh, CD into the folder of your choice. In my case, I'm going to be using the documents folder. Um, let's make a new directory. We're gonna make dir, uh, let's say, we'll call this our crypto app. Uh, CD into the crypto app. And then if you do either npm, well, npx create or yarn create, uh, there's a number of these different commands to start a next application. If you go to the next documentation, so nextjs.org, go to docs, there should be a getting started on the different commands to launch this. The one that I'm going to be using is this yarn create next app TypeScript. I like working in TypeScript a lot. Um, I think it, it's up to you, but there needs to be a very clean way to track your props throughout different React components. And regular vanilla JavaScript has prop types, but TypeScript just offers a much better developer experience once you get used to it. Uh, until you're used to it, it's completely miserable. But, <laughs> but once you got it, it's really fantastic. Um, so we're going to get this command, open up terminal. And they're going to take you through the whole process. Um, they're going to, once we give them the names of everything, they will install the packages that we need, and then they'll give us kind of this boilerplate next application to start working with. Um, we're gonna call this again, our crypto uh, application. It's going to go through and add all the packages for us. Now the benefit with using Yarn is that I think in the background it, I remember I read about this way back when, I don't really remember, but I think it uses Hadoop or something like that, and it caches a lot of your previous packages. So the first time, it's not really any faster than vanilla NPM, but when you reinstall everything, it goes way, way faster. Um, I like it a lot better. I actually find the commands more intuitive too. I hate using this NPX NPM thing. It drives me crazy. I just use Yarn. Uh, once that's all complete, you can CD into the folder once it's cloned. We have crypto application, uh, then open up the developer environment of your choice. Um, clearly my VS code <laughs> command isn't installed, um, but we can just open this up the old fashioned way. Yes, I do trust the authors that created this. And here we go, we have our boilerplate application. Okay, if you're coming from Create React App, this actually probably looks pretty similar to you. Uh, the different folders and directories are kind of the same with the exception of this pages folder. Now, the, the difference here is in if you're using Create React App, you probably have like a components folder. You create all of your components in there. You place them on your 
higher order, like your larger pages, and then you use that to create your app, and then you use something like React Router to navigate the different pages. Now, the way that Next works differently, and part of the reason why I love it, is that if you need to create a new route, you just create a new file in pages. We can maybe do, let's call this myroute.tsx. And we can pretty much put in there whatever we want, and we just created a new route. So if we go to our root, well, if we go to our, our main route, it'll go to, to that index.tsx page. But if we do a dash my route, it'll go to this my route page. And there's no other configuration that you need. There's no React router. It's way more straightforward. So what I typically will do is thinking of this kind of similar to a, a typical Create React app, I'll have my pages folder and then I'll have a separate components folder. And the components folder will be our more reusable things. And I'll assemble all of those separate components on pages. Now, in the case of this, I think it's going to be a pretty simple application. I'm not going to do anything too hardcore, um, but I'll still kind of make that general folder structure just for a good practice here. Right, so now that we're started with Next, if you do a yarn dev or npm run dev, ooh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm stupid, CD, <laughs> crypto application, now we're talking. Okay, uh, for anybody who doesn't know that, you need the package.json so it knows what script to run. If it's not there, it's not going to realize that it's an actual node project. Now that we have that launched, if we go to our localhost 3000, there we go. We have our base next application. And that main page is everything in this index.tsx file. So all of this little fun Next.js uh, example stuff. Uh, we're, we're pretty much just going to start by getting rid of it. I'm actually going to leave the footer. I'm a big footer fan. But everything in main, that's going to go away. Nice. We have a nice blank screen to work with. Uh, let's change some of these kind of like head items just to make this a bit more adaptable. So we're going to, let's do my fun crypto app. Um, we can probably add in a, a quirky fave icon too later. But for now, this is just what we'll do. These meta tags are really fun. You can, you can play with them a great deal. You can even set them up so that like when people uh, bookmark them on their phone or, or add them to their home screen on their phone, it can have specific icons. You can set it up so like when people share these on Twitter, uh, it says certain things or displays certain um, certain images. It's, it's really quite a fun thing to play with, especially to turn your, your, dinky, your dinky web applications into something that looks more professional. Okay, the next part that we're going to focus on, uh, now that we have our basic next app going, first let's focus on killing this. There we go. Now that we have that basic next app going, let's try to connect it to the CoinMarketCap API. Just look at the information that we're working with, and then from that we can construct our, our data visualization around that. Um, going back to the pro CoinMarketCap dot com slash account on the bottom left you should see an api documentation now if you click that this will give you lots of fun information on how to interact with their api the, if you go through the quick start guide you can read it pretty much what it says is that the way that you authenticate with your coin market cap api is that you pop your key into the header and then the header has to be titled x cmc pro api key what this means is that when, when we're sending a request from our next application, it needs to have that header assigned with the key. And CoinMarketCap will look at that key. It'll say like, okay, this is the account that's set up with it. This is the request. And then it kind of uses that to keep track of, of what you're doing. Like I mentioned, they don't want a circumstance where people are just hammering their API for free. What we're going to do is we're going to set this as an environment variable in our next application. Now, if you've used fetch before, you can easily hard code this, but the downside is whenever you regenerate a new key, if your key expires, you need to have some sort of convenient way to switch this out. Now, the magic of environment variables is that, let's say you have a development and a production environment with different API keys and different accounts. It allows you to seamlessly take the same code that you're using locally, push that to dev, push that to prod. It makes your life a lot easier. For now, it doesn't really matter that much, but it's a, it's a big best practice for me. So we do new file, we're going to call this .env.local. If you're used to using the .env package, you're probably used to just having .env. The .local is a specific Next.js thing. Um, and what we can do is assign environment variables here. Uh, we're going to take this XCMC ordeal, open up VS Code, paste that down. And then right after the equal sign, this is where you're going to pop in your API key. Now I'm trying to keep mine hidden. So you're not going to see me actually do that. But pretty much just go back to the uh, coin market cap pro thing. Press on that window to the left, it'll give you the key, copy that key, 
paste that in over here and then press save and you're good to go. Okay, if we flip back over to our index.tsx, the environment variable that we just created, we wanna make sure that it's getting passed through. Now, if you're coming from normal create react app, this is probably, you're gonna be like, oh, this is so simple. We're just gonna do console.log and then you're gonna do the process.env and then the name of the, the environment variable. However, this actually won't work in Next. The reason why is that these environment variables don't live on the client side, they live on the server side. And this is quite a good thing because if you have a user using your application, you don't want them digging through the source code and then somehow you know, being able to obtain that API key. You want that to live on the server side. Now, you can expose server-side variables to the client side in Next using, I think the syntax is Next underscore um, client, or I, I forget what it is. If you put that before the environment variable, it'll expose it to the client side. But for now, we're just going to have this live on the server side. Uh, what we need to do is we need to run this console.log on the server and not on the client. The way that we can run something server side here is that uh, next has a few built in functions. If we do const and then title it get server side props like this. Oh, my bad. That's what we're looking for. If you do the get server side props, and then you make this an export. This is actually code that next will run on the server side. Now, the idea with this is that if you're doing your data fetching, and then it's something that is not being constantly updated, maybe your your client, your user isn't giving direct input and needs data changes, if it's something that just kind of shows up, uh, for example, I don't know, let's say you are, let's say you're going to walmart.com. The content that you're going to on walmart.com, unless you're applying filters, the things you're seeing by default are just pulled out of the database. It's not really something that the user is directly going in and changing constantly. It's probably something that could be rendered server side. And in that case, you can run something like this to fetch the data beforehand on the server. And then when you pass it over to your client, it's it's a complete HTML page. It's, it's, uh, it's quite nice. Um, now this function, if we do a console.log here, we can actually access that environment variable. So it's process.env, uh, and what did I call this again? It was, um, okay, my bad, it was called XCMC Pro API Key. Uh, now for the sake of anonymousness, I'm going to do a dot char at, and let's say like zero. Just so you only see the first thing there, uh, <laughs> again, I don't want to expose my API key. You'll notice that VS Code automatically put the question mark in here. Now, the reason for doing this is that let's say this comes up as null or undefined. If we're trying to run a function on that, that a function that's really designed to be run on a string and we're running it on something that's not a string, it's going to throw an error and crash the application. So in the case that this is undefined, we want to make sure that it says, no, okay, don't run this next function on it if it's undefined. That's all that it means. Now, in this get server side props, we're required to return something just to keep next from getting pissed at us. Eventually, what this return will do is it's going to grab our data and then pass it over to our client side. For now, it's just going to be this empty, sad JavaScript object right here. And if we start, our, start up our ah, if we start up our application using yarn dev. And we pop over to our local host. Look at that, a hearty F. That does mean we are receiving our API key and we can begin fetching our data. Okay, going back to our API documentation, they will give you an overview of the different endpoints. And depending on the type of data that you want from the CoinMarketCap API, you can choose what endpoint to hit and get the information that you need. Now, I did not spend a particularly long time going through this, but if you go under their quick start guide, they give you this listing latest, latest endpoint. I think this will be probably the one that we end up using, but let's see if it gives us the data that we need. Uh, now, again, on the documentation, they have a little rundown in Node.js, Python, PHP, whatever. Uh, okay, we're just gonna write this ourselves. Okay, we're gonna start by doing, let's do a const res equals await fetch and we're going to pop our URL in right here. But alas, await expressions are only allowed in async. Rookie error. <laughs> make sure to make this an asynchronous function. Uh, and we can pop our URL directly into that string right there. Let's get our latest. Control C and put that right there. Now, in addition to fetching this, we're going to give this a number of options. 
Uh, this kind of defines the style of the request, and it's also where we're going to set the headers. Uh, we're going to start by doing a method. Let's make this a get. There's a lot of different HTTP requests. You have get, you have post. In this case, we're getting data. We are <laughs> receiving data. Makes sense to use get. Uh, and then this is also where we can set headers. Now the headers, it has a very specific name that we have to assign it, and this is specific to the CoinMarketCap API. If you're used to authenticating with other APIs, you're probably used to setting the authorization header. This is just a uh, CoinMarketCap cork, if you will. And we're going to assign that header to our API key, which we access using this. And it'll probably give us a little typing thing. Yep, exactly. Now, it can't have this as undefined, right? If this is undefined, it's going to get pissed at us. And if we never set our environment variable, yet we're trying to access this, it's going to give us an undefined. Uh, what we need to do is set an alternative to this in the case that it doesn't find it. Uh, so if this ends up giving us undefined, it's not sending undefined in that final HTTP request. Undefined, not JSON serializable. <laughs> it's not going to be very happy with us. So we're going to give this, this double pipe. That's like an or, like a this or that. And we're going to put an empty quote there. And what that will do is it's going to check if this is a thing. If it's not a thing, it's going to default to this empty quote. And then the authorization will fail. No problem. All right, now that, that response is written, let's get rid of the original log over there. We're going to do a console.log. Let's do await res.json. Now that's going to pull the data out of the response that we get. It's going to log it, and it's going to let us see if it's useful or not. Okay, let's try launching this and seeing what happens. Let's do a yarn dev and see if we get the information that we need out of this. Nice. Now this might make us refresh our local host. Yep, let's do that. Oh, look at all this data. Okay. Now if you go through this, this is kind of not, this doesn't appear to give us what we want. Uh, the reason why is you have the name of the coin, you have their symbol, where it ranks, etc. And we're kind of looking for values like prices, volume, but my assumption is that it probably lives in one of these nested areas. We just need to break it down a little bit. Oh, okay. I'm stupid. Now, <laughs> if you go in and you look at the response that comes, uh, it comes in actually a, a JavaScript object with the keys data and then status. Status being, I'm assuming, some information about the API. The area that we were seeing was the area that lived in data, but we actually need to access that data by going within the data that we're receiving and then checking the key data. Now, we're going to change this to a better name so it doesn't confuse people, namely myself. Uh, we'll call this um, latest prices. I like that. We're going to put that right here. If we access the data, then it will log the actual information that we want to get. And then if we, let's say, grab zero, the first thing from there, question mark, and then let's do quote. Let's see if that gives us the kind of information that we want. Ah, there we go. Look at that. US dollar price volume couldn't be better. Uh, in order to do our visualization piece, what we're going to do is pull out the quote information for each of the different items that we're receiving back in data, and by doing that, get the current prices of all the cryptocurrencies. Now, let's try to pass this data to our UI, and I think that's probably where we will end our first tutorial. Uh, it's very simple from here. Just go inside props. Just pop in, let's say, data. Latest prices. All right, the way that we can then acknowledge that we're getting that data is we can put a props over here on our next page. Uh, we're going to give this a type of any. This is, again, not a good practice. I'm just going for, <laughs> for efficiency here at the moment. Uh, console.log. Ideally, you'd give this like a real, uh, some real variable, uh, some actual typing. You'd write out what that object would look like, and it's, it's a much better way to go about things. But right now, not worried about it. Um, console.log, let's do props.data. We're going to make this little question mark just to avoid it from throwing an undefined error. Now, the difference between the log over here and the log that we were previously doing down here is that this log was server side, whereas now is this log is client side. It may not seem different, but the power of it is incredible because now it means that you're getting that data on the actual browser and not just on the server. There we go. And check it out. Look at that. There's all of our data. Uh, what we're going to focus on in our next part is that we're going to take all of this data, we're going to probably use something like Lodash to um, process all of it, put it in a format that we want, and then we're going to get super creative with our visuals. We're probably going to use 
um, but a number of different JavaScript charting libraries to, to make some really fun interactive stuff. Uh, so as always, if you like the content, like, subscribe. Uh, we really appreciate it. It really helps out the channel and looking forward to seeing you next time.